democracias podem variar? Que variáveis são essas que caracterizam as democracias? Como pensar esses desafios acerca das democracias em diferentes países e como este fenômeno, a democracia, se comporta em cada um deles? Seria possível, então, pensar em variedades democráticas? Professor, como nós identificamos variedades democráticas entre os países? Que variáveis são essas? Como podemos pensar esse ambiente da democracia em diferentes lugares? That's a good question. It's a difficult one to answer because many people have been writing and thinking about democracy for 2000 years. Um, and so as a result of that, there are many different types or several different types of democracy. Um, North American <coughs> political science tends to think about one particular kind of democracy that tends to be an electoral democracy, kind of a low standard for democracy uh, that many people identify with Robert Dahl, a political scientist who wrote about his concept of polyarchy, which is just a conventional standard for national level democracy, kind of a low standard. It says that uh, an elected government that's chosen in free and fair elections, an environment with competition, with freedom of speech, other civil liberties, and with a broad suffrage is what qualifies as a more or less democratic government these days. But that concept is not sufficient for a lot of people who have thought about democracy in the past. And so there are, um, there are critiques of the concept of mere electoral democracy uh, that try to add things to it to say that it can't really be democratic unless you, you have this quality. So for example, Uh, many people talk about liberal democracy. And so liberal democracy is a different variety. It's a variety that warns us that um, you can't, well, that an elected leader could become an elected dictator uh, without some kinds of contrapesos, uh, some checks and balances uh, to constrain the executive between elections. And so in liberal democracy, uh, you have to have a strong legislature, you have to have strong courts, you have to have constitutional guarantees for freedom of speech, uh, freedom of organization, freedom from torture, freedom from murder, other kinds of things. And those things uh, condition an electoral democracy so that executive cannot be too powerful. So that's one variety of democracy. Um, another variety of democracy uh, can be participatory democracy. It says that it's not enough for citizens just to cast a vote every two years, every four years, every five years. There have to be channels for participation in between elections. There has to be some way for citizens to formally express their opinions and what they want and communicate with the government in between those, uh, those, those years. And so this provides for things like party primaries, Uh, for, uh, for hearings, uh, for jury trials in some countries, uh, even, even for something that has happened often in Brazil for participatory municipal budgeting. Mm -hmm. Things like that are part of participatory democracy. Even in some views, strikes and demonstrations and other kinds of informal participation uh, that don't guarantee political equality but provide citizens with some other channel for making their views known. That helps participation. Another um, idea is the idea of deliberative democracy, which uh, springs from the ideas of Jürgen Habermas and many other people who say that uh, governments have to earn the, the right to rule. They have to earn their authority. And the way that they can do this is by uh, having constant dialogue with people, dialogue on very respectful terms so the governments listen and they explain their policies uh, in very clear ways, they're transparent, uh, they show a lot of respect for people, uh, they, treat, uh, they treat opposition politicians like equals, um, and so by, uh, by behaving in this way, governments can earn the right to rule. And finally, there is a view uh, of egalitarian democracy that says that um, elections don't guarantee political equality. 
political equality can't happen unless there is some basic equality in the distribution of material resources like housing and food. People cannot be equals if they're homeless or if, they have, or if they're starving. Um, and also um, access to information. People have to have some education. They have to be informed about uh, the issues before them in order, to, uh, in order to earn the right to act as free and equal citizens in the polity. So these are, these are at least what my project uh, considers five basic varieties of democracy. Diante dessas diferenças ou desses diferentes modelos ou formas de enxergarmos as democracias e os conceitos de democracia, é possível estabelecer um conjunto de variáveis capazes de medir essas democracias ou a eficiência dessas democracias em diferentes países e, por exemplo, num país como os Estados Unidos, em que os estados guardam entre si certas independências, inclusive legais e constitucionais, é possível constituir indicadores de democracia que mostrem que existam, por exemplo, entre os mais de 50 ou cerca de 50 estados americanos, diferentes níveis de democracia entre os estados? Well, I certainly think that it's possible to, to establish indicators to measure levels of democracy at the national level. Uh, in fact, I'm one of several people who, are, who have uh, created a Varieties of Democracy project that has that precise goal. We've uh, defined several hundred different indicators to measure different aspects of democracy. And we've succeeded, I think, in producing these measures of how democratic or how undemocratic uh, different uh, countries are uh, with respect to these five different varieties of democracy. Um, doing this at the subnational level, for example, the 50 states of the United States or the states of Brazil, uh, is a more difficult task um, because uh, it requires a lot of information that is hard to find. Uh, you know, in, in our project, we contemplated doing that, uh, but it's, you know, we rely on, on experts who have a lot of knowledge about politics. Um, and if you're asking about politics at the national level, there are many people who could claim valid expertise to answer questions about this. But if you're asking about uh, very specific things about what was going on in Alabama, or Minas Gerais in 1910, there are not many people who, are, who have enough knowledge to answer those questions in a very reliable way. So uh, the, the more specific the information is, the harder it is to get good answers to that. But for national level concerns, yes, I think it's possible and I think we've done it. Voltando um pouco especi especialmente na questão da poliarquia. É, existe um desafio associado à ideia de tentar observar liberdades, de formar e aderir a organizações, e diversidade de fontes de informação. Seriam as duas, os dois eixos, digamos assim, é, desse conceito de poliarquia. Mas nós temos alguns problemas em relação a esse sistema, por exemplo. Concentração de poder... Uh, concentração de força no poder executivo, eh, desigualdades sociais e econômicas muito adensadas, muito fortes, muito presentes, eh, apatia por parte dos indivíduos em relação à política. É possível estabelecer alguma reflexão sobre como vencer esses desafios em relação ao não funcionamento do que seria o poliarquia, a poliarquia, enfim, alguma coisa assim? Well, I, I do think that uh, the three challenges that you mentioned are serious challenges that some countries face in the world today. Uh, you know, we, we have seen in Latin America uh, some presidents who have concentrated a lot of power in their hands. I probably don't have to name them. Um, and that has created problems for democracy in, in certain Latin American countries. And not just Latin America, but even in Eastern Europe now, in Poland and Hungary, 
Uh, we, we see similar tendencies, and Russia, of course. Um, uh, problem of social inequalities is always a challenge. There's no society on earth that's perfectly equal. Uh, and so, and these, these uh, material inequalities and uh, information inequalities often translate into political inequalities as well. And that's something that always needs to be uh, addressed with social policies. Uh, in terms of, of apathy, um, I think the responsibility for addressing apathy falls first on the political class, first on politicians who have to be in the position of making interesting, believable, credible offers, uh, defining their platforms, speaking about policy, um, and doing it in such a way that people can believe that they actually will do what they're promising to do. Um, and that is, I mean, there, there's a lot of cynicism, there's a lot of apathy in many countries now about uh, the offerings that parties are making. Um, and I, th I think that uh, the only solution for that is to keep participating in elections, keep, uh, as we say, throwing the bums out, getting rid of bad politicians. Um, and uh, so I guess participation is secure for apathy. A democracia é a melhor alternativa para a crise da democracia. Seria algo mais ou menos assim. Yes, I would say so. The, the solution to poor democracy is better democracy, more democracy. Norberto Bobbio, pensador político italiano, falava que a educação política ou a educação para a política era a promessa não cumprida da democracia. Em que medida o senhor entende que os países em geral, que as nações estão preparadas, algumas já fazem isso, mas estão preparadas para a formação dos seus cidadãos? The, uh, political classes in, in school, uh, is it possible to think about this reality in countries in general? I think it is. Uh, in fact, it used to be um, an important goal of the educational system in many countries, including in the United States. I think it still is in some countries like Canada, because uh, some political parties or some governments have wanted to cut back funding for education, and they often think that it's no longer important to educate students about civic virtue or about uh, what it takes to be a good citizen, or even how our political system works. Um, uh, I think that's, that's uh, something that probably should be remedied. Um, so I'm not sure how, it, how it's done in other countries. I'm not an, an education specialist, but I know it does happen some places. But there's always the risk of doing a poor job of it. Uh, there are countries that provide a lot of education about politics to students, but do so in a biased way uh, to the point where it can become propaganda and make it more difficult for, uh, for young citizens to have expectations that the government will behave in democratic ways. Professor, gostaria de voltar na questão das desigualdades que o senhor apontou para tentar compreender um desafio adicional, que é um desafio bastante discutido e debatido na teoria da democracia, associado à ideia de que, na eleição, nós costumamos dizer que a eleição, o voto, em tese, nas democracias representativas, é o único momento em que todos os cidadãos têm o mesmo peso, têm o mesmo valor, one man, one vote, one value, né? princípio da democracia representativa. É possível defender ainda este ideal com base nas desigualdades, por exemplo, que o senhor apontou, associadas e atreladas a questões, inclusive, de momentos em que o Estado deveria garantir igualdade, por exemplo, acesso à justiça, tratamento das forças em relação às atitudes dos cidadãos. É possível pensar uh, essa igualdade em Estados em realidades tão desiguais, até mesmo de acesso à justiça? 
Well, I, I continue to think that the, the principle of one person, one vote is very important. Uh, it's essential for democracy. Uh, and that the, the voting station, the ballot box, is the only place in the political system where everyone has equal weight uh, when casting a vote. The rich and the poor all count the same. However, I think that's not enough. Uh, that's insufficient for a high quality democracy. Uh, and the inequalities that we have uh, in all societies, more in some than in others, inequalities do interfere with, um, with uh, political inequality. Uh, so, um, you know, systems in which uh, campaign finance uh, uh, requires politicians to receive large donations from people. That's a problem because uh, it, it gives more power, more influence to people who have more money. Uh, and at the other end of the spectrum, systems in which some people are so poor that they don't have time to vote, they don't, um, they don't have a realistic possibility of getting to the polls, uh, they don't have um, much information about who to vote for, they're more tempted to sell their votes. Uh, that's a problem too. So I, I think it's a constant struggle to try to uh, address these social, economic, and informational equal, inequalities so that we can achieve greater political equality. No Brasil, nós construímos a ideia de que a democracia estaria muito fortemente associada à realização periódica de eleições. E desde os anos 80, o Brasil tem conseguido cumprir essa agenda. Desde 1982, nos governos estaduais, desde 1985, nos governos municipais, e desde 1989, a eleição para presidente da República tem se repetido no Brasil de maneira constante, consolidando essa ideia da eleição como sinônimo de democracia. Mas nós demoramos muito, e talvez ainda o Brasil não esteja perto de consolidar a ideia de justiça, de que a justiça esteja presente, por exemplo, para os políticos, é, para, os, para os mais poderosos, para os mais ricos. Nós temos alguns sinais de que isso está acontecendo, mas ainda não temos certeza se isso será a nossa realidade. Qual a importância do sentimento de justiça dentro de uma democracia? I think justice is very important and access to justice is very important. It's also very difficult. Uh, I think it's often the weak link in the chain of democracy in many countries. Uh, and countries vary a lot in um, how much equal access to the justice system there is. There are some that do a very good job. Uh, I, I think in Latin America, Costa Rica has an exemplary judicial system where it's very, and like so many citizens have access to justice that they have clogged the courts with so many cases that it's difficult for judges to process them all in time. Uruguay has a very good justice system. Uh, but uh, most of the rest of the countries, there, there are problems, uh, either problems of inefficient uh, judicial systems um, or problems of a lack of judicial independence uh, in which uh, judges, courts, justices um, are, have political loyalties or alliances that, uh, that trump or uh, over, overrule their, their judgment about the law for political reasons or uh, are subject to bribery. Uh, some of them are corrupt in some cases, uh, and that can interfere with administration of justice as well. Um, so that's, that's a difficult challenge to overcome. Uh, there's a lot of variation within Latin America on that and across the world. Em relação à questão da corrupção, que o senhor observa, é um dos maiores desafios da democracia no mundo ou, mais especificamente, é um dos maiores desafios da democracia, em especial na América Latina? Corruption is a difficult problem that's happening in all regions of the world. Not in every country, but some countries in every region. 
Um, uh, our, our Varieties of Democracy project has five indicators of corruption, and we've traced that for many countries over a long period of time. And one of the surprising findings we have is that even though democracy has been improving on average uh, over the course of the 20th century and beyond, um, corruption has gotten a bit worse on average, coinciding with democratization. And it's kind of a paradox. Why is it that countries are becoming more corrupt even when they're becoming more democratic? Michael Coppedge, professor de ciência política na University of Notre Dame e um dos principais pesquisadores projeto de variedades democráticas. Professor, um Brasil agradece muito a entrevista e a conversa com o senhor. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. <risos> Thank you.